Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Light Reading Executive Spotlight Q&A. This is Light Reading's sponsored podcast series exploring the companies and the technologies that are moving the industry forward. My name is Sterling Perrin. I'm an analyst here with Heavy Reading. And today I'm joined with uh, by Bashar Abdullah from Siena. Hi, Bashar. Thanks uh, for joining the podcast and welcome. Hi. Thanks, Sterling. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, looking forward to the discussion. And what will we be discussing? So we're, we're going to be talking about some of the details around network synchronization for 5G networks. Um, of course, network synchronization is not unique to 5G. Uh, it's been in previous mobile generations, but 5G does bring a new set of requirements to synchronization. And as operators are moving from their initial rollouts of 5G to, to 5G Advanced specifically, and then ultimately generations beyond, there's new requirements or summer requirements are coming becoming much more stringent, and then also uh, new requirements coming in line. So we're going to talk about all of this over the minutes that we have. Uh, Bashar, let's just um, kind of start out maybe at a high level. Um, can you talk about the importance of network synchronization for 5G that would distinguish it from past generations, and I guess specifically, you know, 4G, which is the generation that we've, of course, come off. So 4G to 5G, what, what, what is the uh, importance of network um, synchronization? So let's first uh, uh, look at the, the problem statement. So what does 5G promise? It, it promises higher bandwidth, lower latency, higher subscriber densities um, that is delivered primarily by carrier aggregation, uh, enhanced uh, coordinated, coordinated multipoint technologies, as well as improved coverage with PICO and FEMTO cells. Now to achieve these improvements, uh, 5G new radios rely on more accurate and reliable frequency phase and time clocks. And the difference in accuracy uh, that we're talking about is, you know, previous generations of 3GPP networks uh, relied on a plus or minus 1500 nanoseconds of absolute time error relative to UTC compared to uh, the 5G advanced services that require plus or minus 65 nanoseconds relative offset between 5G new radios that participate in delivering these higher bandwidth and lower latency services, such as MIMO and transmit diversity. Now that's a that's more than a 20-fold increase in clock accuracy. And the importance of these uh, of delivering these types of uh, more time-sensitive services is to maximize the recovery of the spectrum investment more efficiently based on the same infrastructure capex. Yeah. So getting back, so you know, 65 nanoseconds versus 1500. The, the 1500 I've certainly heard heard quite a bit about. As we talked about the initial rollouts of 5G, I, I think largely that was that was the number that was kind of the, the target to hit. Um, are you saying that as we go to 5G advanced is where the, the 65 nanosecond uh, relative time error is is largely coming into play? It's a it's a 5G advanced number, basically. Yeah. So so there's different categories of services that 3GPP defines and the 1500 nanosecond accuracy requirement remains mm -hmm. uh, and what 5g and 5g advanced new radios require it, to achieve those higher bandwidth lower latency services uh, is to uh, synchronize the radios participating in the delivery of those services to a far more stringent accuracy and in this case in the the top tier what what's referred to as a plus services they require coordination and synchronization of the radios to within plus or minus 65 nanoseconds of time error. So those radios actually need to meet always the 1.5 apps, the 1.5 microsecond accuracy requirement always. And then when they need to deliver those higher class of services, they need to also achieve the plus or minus 65 nanosecond relative time error. Right. And that that's one distinction that as I've dug into this has become uh, an important one is relative versus absolute. The first one is absolute. The other one, relative, and you're talking radio to to radio, correct? Right. That is correct. So, so given that, and and just the the requirements for for network synchronization and five G generally, how ready would you say network operators are today? And if there's distinctions by region, I'm sure it's not a a one size fits all. But just kind of in a general sense, do you, are, are operators ready from a synchronization standpoint? Uh, as you mentioned, it, it varies, not just within 
the various regions uh, of the globe, but also within the regions themselves, different operators are at different stages of establishing their timing networks to to achieve these more stringent uh, timing requirements. Mm -hmm. Some are prepared to deploy uh, the the architectures and the technologies to achieve those. Uh, some are still in the learning phase, let's call it. Mm -hmm. And the, the 5G advance, just just generally, as far as when, when we would expect these services and networks, as you talk to customers, um, kind of what, what, what timeline are, are, are you seeing? 5G advanced is being defined by release, 3GPP release 18. So obviously there's, it's on its own timeline. I understand that by uh, the end of this year would be the initial release 18 definition. Now, it, it can typically take a, a few cycles for vendors to, uh, to implement those technologies. And so it's not so much when will 5G advanced uh, technology be available, but it's all about the planning. It's not an overnight success in deploying uh, highly sensitive uh, and accurate uh, timing networks. It requires planning ahead of time so that you evolve the architecture of your network to be able to achieve the, these more stringent timing requirements. Yeah, and that's a good point from kind of the mantra I've heard over the years from operators is the transport network needs to be ready in advance of the rollout of, of any type of, of you know mobile service so the the transport network can't can't be lagging otherwise nothing's going to work the topic of uh network timing assurance i guess can you can you define what what is network timing assurance and and then also just explain a bit about why you think network operators who are who are on the podcast here uh should be aware of of this concept sure so 5g services and, and networks in order for them to operate at optimal efficiency, require sync highly synchronized clocks. And ensuring that those clocks are always available is, is fundamental to maintaining the 3GPP networks um, generating revenue. And so not establishing an appropriate timing network architecture to account for various impairments that can result in impacts to mobility networks uh, and it can range from anywhere from being a nuisance as a result of degraded performance, such as lower bandwidth, to mobility network outages. And we've seen these in labs, in lab environments. Uh, and so customers are becoming fully aware of the importance of not just deploying highly accurate clock distribution solutions, but ensuring that they are always available, meaning ensuring that their network architecture provides resiliency. And so the key trend in network timing now is the need for assurance to the same level as service connectivity. And so timing network reliability and delivering highly accurate clocks under normal and anomalous network conditions are key risk factors for achieving 5G network synchronization. Now we're also seeing from global events, uh, you know, we're all aware of what's happening in the globe, impairments that can be either intentional and in some cases unintentional and there are also impairments that could occur because of environmental conditions uh, that can directly affect a timing network. And planning for these types of occurrences using economically viable timing solutions is critical to maintaining the mobility network operating at its optimal level to maintain the highest potential for, for spectrum ROI. Yeah, we've certainly seen as we've done our surveys the, around 5G, the, the reliability requirement going up and up the the list of, of priorities to i think probably at this point the, the the top of the list is certainly in the in the top one to two reliabilities become a big deal uh, i think for a number of reasons you know differentiation uh even connecting into monetization uh and certainly uh good points about the synchronization needs to be reliable or um or again the whole kind of house of cards falls apart if not so we, you've kind of outlined a, a set of a, a need for this, but what, what would you say are, are the, the kind of the solutions or technologies that are available that can help ensure reliability of synchronization? Yeah, so as we see our network, our customers' networks evolve, uh, they're primarily seeking two key requirements, obviously the greater accuracy and the enhanced resiliency. 
And there are physical as well as packet uh, synchronization technologies that are capable of delivering these highly accurate clocks. We're all familiar with GNSS receivers. Uh, they're essentially uh, the different constellations such as GPS or Galileo or even in, in uh, other parts of the world, GLONASS. Uh, and there are several. Some are regional, some are global. They can provide stratum one level of accuracy and they can do so in a distributed uh, architecture. Now, as a standalone solution, GNSS can become economically non-viable in higher density deployments. So as we, as we see 5G networks evolve to, to fill those coverage gaps, the, the cost of deploying GNSS everywhere is, is just is not economically viable. And then we're seeing this uh, from uh, some of the operators uh, recognizing this challenge. And obviously, in order to address the densification of uh, 3GPP networks, there are other methods to distributing highly accurate clocks. And those are have been defined by ITU. The ITU has defined uh, some telecom profiles, which are essentially constraints on how to use the 1588 protocol to adhere to the telecom network uh, architecture requirements for timing. And they include uh, profiles such as the G8275.1 and G8275.2. And they operate over a packet network infrastructure, and uh, they can act as either a primary clock reference, uh, or they can act as a backup uh, to a GNSS that is available. And uh, and this is essential because we've seen uh, an increased number of public reports on uh, GNSS impairments. More specifically in North America, you'll hear it referred to as G G uh, GPS impairments. And as those become more predominant impairments, there has to be another method to maintain the availability of clocks to the mobility network. And that is relying on the network to do so. And that's what the ITU has referred to as assisted timing support. Uh, and so reliability of the clock distribution is based on leveraging these technologies in a timing network architecture to deliver the high availability clocks uh, to achieve the self-healing uh, timing network. Okay. Yeah. Obviously, a lot, uh, a lot in there. You, you've given a good set of references. I, I think for some of the profiles from the ITU and other technologies that uh, hopefully our listeners can can dig into it if they want more information. We're just about out of time, so maybe I'll I'll just close out asking you for Sienna specifically. How? What are some of the things that that you do to address these advanced um, synchronization requirements? Well, Sienna has a broad router and switching portfolio uh, that's deployed globally and with support for an integrated GNSS receiver and the ITU uh, profiles that I had mentioned earlier, uh, including the assisted timing support capabilities uh, and in some cases more advanced uh, assisted timing capability and profile interworking. We're seeing a lot of cases where uh, operators have legacy profiles and they need to uh, modify uh, the profile they're using in the network to adapt to the new generation of radios, uh, profile interworking becomes uh, critical. And so we include that in our portfolio. Now, Sienna's uh, products support all the telecom clock roles, uh, such as the telecom time transmitter, boundary clocks, uh, as well as the time receivers. And overpinning Sienna's synchronization portfolio is our navigator network control suite with timing app. And that is used to manage a timing network. So it gives you a visualization of your uh, timing network. And uh, we've received uh, tremendous and exceptional market attention uh, on that uh, capability. Uh, now, with these capabilities uh, and, and the overall Sina portfolio, we, we can enable flexible deployment models uh, to align with varying customer uh, network architectures and their network synchronization objectives. Some customers need the you know, the platinum level of network resiliency for timing, uh, others not so. Uh, and so we can span and, and cover all of those types of use cases. And off offering assisted timing support for reliability, uh, as well as local phase holdover that can exceed eight hours, can enable our customers, any operator, to build highly reliable and accurate network synchronization solutions to achieve the, the promised goals of 5G networking. All right. Yeah, thank you. Um, we are at this point out of time, as I suspected, uh, when we get into this very uh, deep topic, uh, time goes quickly, uh, no pun intended. 
there is a lot of opportunity for for uh, folks to follow up based on, on some of the information Bashar has shared. But I do want to thank uh, Bashar and Sienna for for hosting today's program. I've learned a lot. Thanks for for sharing your expertise. Thanks for inviting me again. Sure, great. Uh, for the listeners, if you're hearing this podcast series for the first time, please check out this and uh, past episodes at the Light Reading website, which is www.lightreading.com. Thanks everyone for listening. <laughs>